move on from that. Now, I do want to begin with uh, a story this morning, and you might think of it as a bit of a confession, depending on how you reflect on it. Um, I've shared on a number of occasions that my experience of learning to drive was a character-building experience for me. Um, 16 months, eight practical tests, fair amount of stress. Um, There are silver linings to it because I think I am really well placed now to pastorally support people who fail their driving tests, unless they fail them more than me. But anyway, if you've ever, you know, if you've learned to drive and you, you know, you remember, maybe remember that day, I can still remember passing, I, I tested over it in Eastbourne, and I remember walking across the front, I had to walk into Eastbourne where I was doing my year out, and, that's, and it, it's just this momentous moment, because the freedom that you suddenly have. Um, And if you're fortunate to have a set of wheels to use as well, um, you then really can experience that freedom. So what did I do with that freedom? Well, one of the first things I did was I followed the suggestion of someone who was older. Um, I certainly thought wiser at the time. Um, They were a member of the church here when I was a young adult. And their suggestion was to take on the challenge of freewheeling in neutral from the top to the bottom of the driveway over at Ashburnham Place. Um, if you don't know, maybe you join us on it, it's a Christian conference centre not far from here. Um, it's where I lived from when I was 11 until I met Emma and then got married and moved away to, to Bexhill and that sort of thing. And Ashburnham has, it's a mile from the gate right down the back, uh, round it, the house over um, to the back uh, bridge. Um, Let's just be clear at the very beginning of this story. Um, I'm not advocating this or advising it in any way, shape or form. It would be very irresponsible. Um, But if you are interested, the aim of it, okay, is you go through the gates, obviously having carefully turned off the main road, um, and there's a flat bit of road that you've got to still drive along, that sort of thing. And then you go over this first speed bump, and it's at that point that you kind of take your foot off the accelerator, push the clutch in, um, and you seek to coast down as far as you can before your car comes to a stop. Um, It's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, You've obviously got the potential of oncoming traffic at points. If that does happen, that means it's null and void and you've got to stop because that's obviously the safe thing to do. Um, But you've also got the main corner to contend with. Um, Apparently, you get up quite a bit of speed, more than you think, before you get to that corner. Uh, You've then got another speed bump a bit further down, um, at which point you've got to kind of pray forgiveness from the bottom of your car um, as you take that. Um, The bridge is is fairly straightforward. It's a nice bridge. Um, Obviously, you've got the slight challenge that there may be vehicles coming the other way that you may not have seen um, because of the bridge uh, and the bump and that sort of thing. Um, But once you're over that, it's then all down to momentum. Um, and whether you'll make it round past the West uh, Garden over a, a further bump um, before the final hill. And again, uh, you know, gravity takes it, it's, it's, does its thing. And hopefully, a bit more speed, you make it into the main car park. Um, if you do it on the right sort of occasion, the car park's fairly empty. And you can then just pull in and you don't even have to adjust your vehicle or anything and that sort of stuff. Now, I don't know if you've ever found yourself doing that. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands um, this morning. Um, Or just maybe just that whole thing when you just kind of coast in your vehicle, um, when you just push the clutch in um, and, you know, the engine revs drop and you're freewheeling. Maybe you do it as a bit of a money-saving mind thing in your head, whether it is or not, I don't know. Um, Perhaps, though, you have probably found yourself doing it. Maybe when you're waiting at traffic lights, if you live in battle, that's a regular occurrence. Um, but you find yourself waiting in traffic, and rather than start, you know, put the engine into to, to gear and that sort of stuff, you just, you know, your foot clutch is still in, you just let the brake off, and you slowly ease forward while you're waiting um, for your turn, and then to sign, finally move forward. You know, the car um, may physically not be in, in neutral, but it's not in gear, and so you're, you're effectively, uh, you know, just coasting, um, whether it's a long distance or maybe just a, a short one. Now, the problem is there's two things in this moment that, that one needs to take into account. Um, however long you're kind of desiring to freewheel and coast for. The first is if we stay in neutral and if we simply coast, at some point we will slow down and stop. At some point the hill will end and the vehicle will come uh, to be stationary. It will cease to move. The other, potentially slightly more problematic uh, thing that will uh, take uh, effect, 
is we actually lose control. Now, on the whole, we don't when we do it, because if, you know, you've got your foot over the brake um, and you're looking at your surroundings and all this sort of thing, uh, and if any point you need to, you can, you know, release the clutch and the engine will kind of hopefully stutter uh, at the right speed and all those sorts of things, uh, and you'll continue on your way. But the truth of the matter is, if we freewheel, if we, you know, coast, if we sit in neutral, call it whatever you will, ultimately we'll get nowhere, And whether we choose to believe it or not, we're lessening the control we have in terms of where we're going to end up. And I think the same is true uh, when it comes to our faith. When it comes to the lives of disciples, when we think about what it means to follow Jesus. Coasting uh, in neutral will ultimately get us nowhere. And actually, I think it comes with that warning Because actually, it's quite dangerous. Because at that point, we're no longer in control of where we're heading. I want to turn to the Bible um, and the book of Esther. I'm going to read from chapter 4, the first, you know, the 14 verses in Esther chapter 4. I encourage you to turn to it, open it up, um, follow along. Uh, as we read, maybe a, a passage you're very familiar with, maybe you've never heard this or reflected on it before, but starting at verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and family attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept. Then Esther summoned Hathor, one of the king's eunuchs, designed to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Athak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in the front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, excluding, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and to explain to her. And he told him in, to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Athet went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. And she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law. They are to be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. It's a little bit of background to this book. Uh, the unknown author of the book of Esther was most likely a Jew, uh, someone who was familiar with the royal Persian court. Uh, the book is you know, named after the heroine uh, of the story. Uh, she was taken from her guardian Mordecai and forced to uh, compete, really, in some kind of beauty pageant for the king's affection. She won, um, therefore she was crowned Queen of Persia, um, but still there's a lot that could be said there uh, about the whole goings on. The events of the book of Esther um, occurred between 483 uh, and 473 BC, which is the kind of the first half of the reign of King Xerxes uh, when Esther uh, was queen. Um, 
Esther is the only book in the Bible, you may be aware or may not, that doesn't mention the name of God. Um, But it's not to say that God is absent. Um, His presence, it kind of permeates much of the story. And there's, you know, some suggestions um, that very much you can see him behind the scenes, almost coordinating coincidences and circumstances uh, to make different things happen. Now, it's during uh, this time period uh, that the first remnant of Jews had returned to Judah. Um, But Esther and Mordecai, along with many other Jews, had chosen not to make that journey. Um, So it stayed in Susa, uh, the capital of Persia, which is where this story um, is set. And kind of just going back, you know, preceding chapter four, uh, there is a whole load that is going on here. In short, uh, this guy Haman has come to harbor this vendetta against this guy Mordecai. All because Mordecai wouldn't kneel down or pay honor to him. That's kind of the, the nub of it. Um, so Haman, as it says in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 6, yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Um, and the king, as we read on, uh, gets caught up in this, uh, verse 10. Uh, so the king took his signet ring from his finger, gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, uh, the enemy of the Jews. Keep the money, the king said to Haman, and do with the people as you please. So then in verse 13, uh, dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces from the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. So that's the moment that we've kind of arrived at as we read this passage uh, in chapter 4. And Mordecai basically asks Esther to go to the king uh, and beg him for mercy for, for the Jews, for, for her people, for, for Mordecai's people. Uh, it's thought there were maybe 15 million Jews scattered throughout the Persian Empire um, at this point. And because of Haman's hostility and potentially the king's stupidity, depending which way you look at it, all of them were going to die unless they left the kingdom. That's kind of the, the scenario here. Yet for all the the direness of this situation, Esther's reply is one of, well, hold on a second, though. Um, I can't just go to the king. Yes, I'm the queen, but uh, unless you're invited, the likelihood is is that you'll be put to death. And just to so you fill in on the picture, the king's not asked me to come to him for like a month. So kind of read between the lines here. I'm not necessarily, you know, kind of, you know, the most favored person at the moment. He, he's not eager to see me. There's no guarantee that if I show up, um, I'm going to be, you know, allowed to stay. And actually, it's therefore uh, not going to look that great for me. And it's it may be easy to, to read Esther's response and to kind of think, well, basically, she's looking out for her own skin, isn't she? Which is kind of a human response. You know, we might not think there's anything wrong in that. Uh, William Wearsby, uh, the, the commentator, he writes this. He says, I don't think this is an excuse on Esther's part, but rather a plea that Mordecai give her some guidance. He knew palace protocol and he was in touch with what was going on. She was isolated in the harem and unable of devising the kind of strategy needed to solve the problem. Um, he goes on to suggest that he thinks that actually Mordecai has misinterpreted Esther's message, and that actually if they'd have met and had this conversation face to face, um, he would have grasped um, uh, what she was trying to get across and wouldn't have judged her uh, the way he did. It's interesting, another uh, theologian, John Goldingay, he writes this though, he says, Esther's hesitation and fear uh, make her faith and courage even more remarkable and the more real to us. He says, she is not a superhero with special powers, but an abused girl put in a horrible position because of what she is, a beautiful woman. And and I think there's something just to consider as an aside here, uh, because Golden Gate goes on to further suggest, he says, Esther illustrates the way that courage and faith are not incompatible with fear and hesitation. Indeed, they come into their own in the context of fear and hesitation. If there is none of these latter, who needs faith or courage? 
Actually, it's that great challenge there of actually how, you, you know, what does it mean to, to step out and find ourselves maybe in places uh, that are challenging? Um, and actually, it's as we do that that we can then cry out to God um, for all his support uh, that he promises. Mordecai, though, he sends back uh, his answer, though. Uh, he says, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. In other words, he's saying to Esther, uh, you being in the palace, that's not necessarily an accident. Who knows that But you have come to a royal position for such a time as this. You know, Mordecai didn't say God had put her there. But that's kind of what the statement is actually suggesting. And therefore, he's saying, you know, if God has brought you to this place, to this position, uh, then there's obviously a purpose in mind. And Mordecai clearly believes that that purpose is one of interceding for her people. As I was asking God what I felt he wanted me to share today, I really felt this passage kind of just come to the fore, um, and I just couldn't kind of get away from it. Um, you kind of, I don't know if you're thinking of what God's maybe putting something in, like Emma said earlier, maybe gives you a word or something. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes you then kind of go, is that just me, or is that really God? Um, and this, this passage just keep coming back to me, and, and I felt the message that God wanted me to share this morning comes from verse 14. Um, and to bring a similar challenge um, in that who knows, but that you have come to wherever you find yourself for such a time as this. That's you, that's me, that's us here now. That actually God has placed you wherever you find yourselves or wherever he wants you to be for such a time as this. Not by accident, not just to pass time, but for a purpose. I want to show a short film clip. Um, It comes from the film uh, Le Mans 66. It follows the the story of American car designer Carol Shelby and British driver Ken Miles and uh, their battle when they sought to build a a revolutionary race car uh, for Ford uh, in order to beat Ferrari at the Le Mans race in 1966. The the Ferrari had been dominant. um, uh, And in this clip, Shelby offers... Henry Ford II, uh, the opportunity to go for a ride in the car that his company has spent millions making for that very purpose. You know, I started pointing out the danger that comes when we coast or when we freewheel. But more so the danger that I believe there is, if that's true of our faith, if that's true of us as disciples, as those following Jesus. The thing is, on the flip side, the power and the potential of when we're in gear and when we're moving forward and we're purposeful in our actions as we seek to follow God's call on our lives is like nothing else. Let's take a look at this. You ready? The name on the middle of that steering wheel should tell you that I was born ready, Shelby. Hit it. That a boy. It's about right now the uninitiated have a tendency to soil themselves.
<laughs> Mr. Ford. You okay? Mr. Ford. You all right? I had no idea. I had no idea. I wish my daddy, he were alive to see this. <laughs> to feel this. The question I believe that I need to ask, although I'm genuinely not sure I actually want to, is will we serve God wherever that may take us, whatever the cost? Will we hear those words, you know, for such a time as this and respond, okay, God, you lead the way. I said I'm not sure about whether I want to ask that, and that's because as I was, was preparing and praying, I really felt God say, if we take hold of this, if we truly recognize what he has ahead of us and refuse to coast no longer, then it is actually really going to cost us as a church. I think it's going to cost us because gifted people are going to move on because God's going to lead them elsewhere. Um, he's going to train them up uh, and prepare them. Uh, and actually, our human instinct and reaction will be we want to keep things the way they are. Uh, we want to keep things you know, nice and neat. And isn't it great here where actually what God's got is so much greater. So will we serve God wherever that may take us? whatever the cost. You know, Emma comes to finish her ministerial training this summer. I want to ask the question, who is God calling to explore ministry? We've had the election of deacons at the end of last year. I want to ask the question, who is God raising up now for, for leadership in two, four, or whatever many years' time? You know, we have a legacy uh, of supporting world mission in this church. You've heard about it this morning in, in terms of the connection with Claire. Uh, we've got the Mahons next week uh, and various other things. When was the last time as a church we sent someone, we commissioned someone called by God to go on short or long-term mission? And I'm not talking about the summer trips that we do, which are brilliant. I'm talking about someone saying, actually, God is leading them. And as a church, we want to support them and bless them and send them out. You know, do we coast on the history and the legacy of what has gone before, or are we looking to God for what he has ahead of us? Or do we think, well, it's someone else who's going to respond um, to what God is saying? Um, or are we actually seriously saying, okay, God, how are you going to call me? How are you going to guide me? And how can I respond to what you're saying? And maybe this is just me speaking, not God. So there's that slight caveat here. But, but I wonder whether there's some here today who don't want to ask that question because actually asking that question and responding to what God says seriously is going to mean you need to invest in future generations in spite of your own personal interests. Because it will mean asking that question, how can I shape? the church for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, which I'm not going to be a part of. For others, uh, I think it will mean actually saying, looking, where has God actually led you to? And owning actually, who are those people that God is calling you to get to know, to befriend, uh, to stand alongside? You know, what is it that you're, you're in the midst of it? Um, and actually, you just need to respond and say, okay, God, for such a time as this, and we open our eyes to the reality of where we find ourselves. For others, I wonder whether it means actually being willing to, to reach a hand out rather than point a finger at people that we see. I do it. I, you know, you walk around the town, you see people uh, and you think, you know, kind of, you know, sort your life out. Or why are you always in the pub or whatever? And actually go, well, maybe I need to be in that place with them. Maybe I need to actually find out why they're always there. 
or why they're, uh, they're doing what they're doing. It's asking that question, God, what is it you're saying? And being willing to respond. You know, will we serve God as a church and as individuals, wherever that may take us, whatever the cost? Are we willing to go? Let me pray. God, I pray that that your heart and your passion will be what challenge is us today. But I pray that as you call, guide, and send us out, that we may serve as you have created us to, wherever that may lead us. Amen.